Thank you for, uh, for coming to our panel, uh, Clashing Constitutional Norms, Cross-Border Data and Free Expression. We appreciate um, you coming to find us in the basement of the Annex facility on the last day of the conference, <laughs> right after lunch. Um, and we are, we are glad that, uh, that, you don't, that we don't outnumber you. Um, so uh, the, the, the good news is we're hoping to have a uh, relatively uh, free-flowing and uh, collegial conversation among, among the panelists and the audience members. Um, so actually, sometimes the smaller panels are actually the best and the most fruitful. Um, and so we will, uh, in, the, in the parlance of television speak, we will try and break the fourth wall here. Um, and, and have a, a conversation amongst the, the larger group. So our, our panel is uh, organized, in, so I'm, I'm Neil Richards, I'm the, the chair, um, and uh, I teach law at Washington University in St. Louis in the United States, uh, where I co-direct the Cordell Institute for Policy in Medicine and Law, uh, which is the sponsor of this, of this panel. Um, our, our focus at the Institute is to focus on questions of, of human information policy um, be beyond, beyond health. Um, and uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, to my left, our moderator, Jennifer Daskal, is an associate professor of law at American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jen writes and teaches in criminal law, national security law, and constitutional law. And interestingly, um, in the interrelationships and in the international relationships among those three fields. Um, among other things, she's a former attorney at the US Department of Justice, and her recent papers, which are excellent and, and highly recommended, um, have focused on issues related to privacy and law enforcement access to data across borders. We also have three fantastic expert panelists, uh, starting from, from the far left. Uh, we have Laureline Hoot. Uh, Laureline is the Director of Government Affairs for Microsoft Belgium and Luxembourg. Um, she's based here in Brussels and focuses on privacy, law enforcement, cybersecurity, and AI. Before joining Microsoft, Microsoft in March of last year. Uh, Laureline <coughs> worked for the Belgian telecommunications operators Proximus and Orange, which I'm grateful for because my phone is currently roaming on the Proximus network while I'm out of the country. Uh, uh, she was uh, uh, in legal affairs and privacy law and regulatory affairs. Uh, before that, she was a, a practicing lawyer at the law firm that I used to work at, Wilmer Hale. Um, uh, has an LM from KU Leuven, uh, studies at the Ruprecht Karls University at Heidelberg, and studied European law at UL Bruxelles. Uh, second, uh, to uh, Laureline's right, uh, uh, we have Lana Kamuria Donnelly. Uh, Lana is a public policy manager at Google um, and works on uh, governance and strategy for the, for the European and Middle East region. Um, her portfolio um, includes compliance with the GDPR um, and other privacy legislation, implementation of the right to be forgotten, um, Apparently, Google has been, has been working on that a little bit. Um, and, uh, and advising on product launches and, and more. Uh, Lana also practiced law before her current position. She was at the, uh, the, the excellent law firm, almost as good as Wilmer Hale, of, of, of Hogan Lovells, uh, where she worked in the privacy and cybersecurity law departments. Um, Lana has also worked as a, as a news journalist. Uh, she is a graduate of Sciences Po, uh, Columbia University, uh, University Pantheon Assas, and Yale Law School, and currently works out of London. Uh, finally, uh, last and perhaps least, we have uh, Gavin Philipson, um, a British academic uh, who has held a chair since 2007 and just moved from Durham University in the north um, to Bristol University in the west of, of England. Um, Gavin has written extensively on, on privacy, mostly uh, UK and ECHR law, but, but increasingly uh, when Brexit is not occupying his uh, scholarly time um, on the GDPR as well. Um, his work has been highly influential uh, in the policy process in Britain and in several uh, high-profile cases, including the Von, the Von Hanover case. Now, astute readers of the program uh, will note that we had listed Dr. Kirsty Hughes from the University of Cambridge. We were not uh, just using Kirsty's fancy academic affiliation to bait and switch you to attend. Um, unfortunately, uh, Kirsty was stuck in travel chaos due to a snowstorm in Southern Europe, and due to a series of flight cancellations, she was unable to join us from Florence, where she's working this semester. Um, Kirsty sends her sincere regrets. Um, I'm gonna fill in her 
uh, for her spot on the panel. Um, she and I actually published a, a, an article on, on this topic a few years ago, um, so I hope I will be an adequate uh, substitute. So let's turn things over to our moderator, Professor Daskal. Great, thank you, and thanks again to, for all of you for um, being here on a Friday afternoon. Um, so what we're going to do is all of the panelists are going to start by providing um, some opening remarks, um, short remarks, so that we can really make this a model of the discussion and uh, get participation from all of you as well. Um, so I, we're going to start with um, Lana, who's going to give us the lay of the land um, from Google's perspective. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to focus on the right to be forgotten and how we apply it in practice at Google to give a sort of practical perspective on the issues that, that we're going to talk about today. More specifically, I'm going to talk about, give some examples of where we encounter friction between different countries' approaches to balancing free expression and privacy rights. Usually when thinking about different approaches to privacy on either side of the Atlantic, Often I go back to a very well-known article, and I'm sorry if you've read this over and over, but an article by James Whitman called The Two Western Cultures of Privacy. And it contrasts the American view as privacy as liberty, so uh, the right to be let alone, liberty from unreasonable search by the state, and etc., with a European view of privacy as dignity. And to my eyes, the right to be forgotten is one expression of this European view as privacy, of privacy as dignity, as informational self-determination specifically. And so it comes in a specific cultural, legal, historic context, right? So I'm going to give some examples of tensions between this European right and norms of privacy, free expression, and access to information elsewhere. I'm not going to go over the details of the right to be forgotten, which were laid out in the Google Spain uh, decision of the CJEU in 2014. I assume the audience is familiar with it. I'll just remind you very quickly, of course, we're not talking about suppressing speech at its source, but merely delisting the link from search results and searches specifically for the, person, uh, the person's name. Uh, and that the court requires us to make a careful assessment in each case um, of how the requester's right to privacy balances out with others' right to free expression and to access information. So to date, uh, Google has examined about 3 million URLs, and the balance needs to be struck case by case. I'm going to illustrate how it can tip one way or the other. A significant number of government officials, of politicians, and public figures ask for pages about them to be delisted. To give some numbers, to give you an idea, between 2016 and 18, politicians and government officials requested the delisting of more than 33,000 URLs. Other public figures, so celebrities and the like, requested delisting of over 41,000 URLs. In total, that's about 7.4% of all the delisting requests that we got. These groups have a significantly lower rate of acceptance of their right to be forgotten requests because oftentimes there's a weightier public interest in the information remaining available. So for politicians in particular, the delisting rate is about 11% compared with 45% for the general population. And I say this to underline that the possibility of politicians using the right to be forgotten to try and obscure information about, say, past misbehavior is not a theoretical one. We do get such requests. And public figures also have access to reputation management firms, for example, to try and, and scrub their online profiles, if you will. Why is this important? When you think about the geographic scope that the right to be forgotten should have and how you can apply it in a global internet, then this is all the more significant. In countries where free expression rights aren't necessarily as robust, the ability for public figures to request delistings can have an even deeper impact. In 2017, the Inter-American Dialogue uh, published a report about the right to be forgotten and its potential impact on free expression in, in the Americas. It points out uh, about Latin America in particular uh, that the right to be forgotten could be misused to allow those in power to effectively rewrite history. Um, it could in turn inhibit accountability, collective action, 
and people's right to memory. And it, it underlines the importance of this right to memory and right to truth in, um, in Latin America in particular. It gives the example of the El Mosote massacre in El Salvador and the victims fight to recover and to preserve the memory of those crimes. Uh, and it sees the right to be forgotten as potentially, if it is exported, uh, coming into friction with, 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 those, uh, with, with those other important rights. So for all these reasons, they were concerned about giving uh, Europe's right to be forgotten, global application, and effectively importing its effects into countries of, with a very different historical context. And it's not only about different histories or the risks posed by authoritarian regimes misusing the right. Even in countries with uh, strong free expression rights, the law can vary and we can see friction as well. In one case, for example, a French resident requested that we delist pages from a government website, a, a Texas official website, that listed the person as violating a Texas court order to pay child support. Uh, the Texas jurisdiction had made this decision to name and shame people who did not uh, fulfill their obligations to pay child support by publishing that information. So delisting that URL may have been in accordance with France's view of the balance to strike between privacy and others' right to access information, but it would have been directly in conflict with the policy explicitly adopted by the state of Texas. On a global internet to finish, how do you reconcile them? Well, at Google, the solution we have found, at least in the current state of the art, is IP restricting, based on, so otherwise known as geo-blocking, based on the location we infer from the IP address of the person making the search. Um, it hides delisted content for users who search from an IP address in the country where the request was made, so a European country. And users in other parts of the world can continue to access information that in their countries is lawful. Uh, it allows for effective implementation of the right to be forgotten for Europeans, but also respects the rights of other countries to strike that balance for themselves in accordance with their legal traditions and their histories. And so I think the, I look forward to the panel discussion on how we can actually reconcile um, and move beyond these areas of friction in the current state of the art. This is what, what we have found as a solution. Thank Great, you. thank you. Thank you very much. As probably everyone here knows, that that precise issue is now pending before the European Court of Justice about the geographic reach with the French DPA um, arguing that Google has an obligation to link material pursuant to the right to be forgotten across all of its um, sites, regardless of where accessed and without. Um, that the geo blocking, the filtering that was just mentioned, is not is not adequate, um, which. Um, will be interesting to see what happens with that case. So now um, I'll turn it over to Laura Lane. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to speak about the um, role that companies um, can play or play in these um, areas of legal tension. Mm -hmm. Maybe before uh, starting off, I, I'd like to make a parenthesis on Belgium because when speaking about uh, clashing fundamental rights and norms. Belgium is sometimes a bit peculiar, so I thought it was maybe more than a coincidence that I was on this panel, because in Belgium we had in uh, April 2016 a judgment from our highest civil court, for example. Uh, uh, it was in a case that opposed a uh, newspaper, Le Soir, and uh, a car driver who had caused an accident. Uh, and the gentleman uh, wanted his uh, name to be uh, removed from the article in the database from Le Soir. And the uh, Cour de Cassation, the highest court, decided yes, his right to privacy prevailed over the right to free speech of the newspaper. And I mean, this is typically uh, considered as a quite drastic, intrusive um, in, uh, measure into the free speech. It goes beyond the, the, the just. Uh, not making, uh, not allowing indexing in, in, in search en en engines. Uh, so that's the first one, which is a bit peculiar. And then uh, we have another one. Um, it's not exactly free speech, it's law enforcement, where uh, Belgian uh, courts have a long tradition of considering that they um, can apply law enforcement provisions uh, towards uh, externally, towards companies abroad, and we even have a case pending still with Skype, 
uh, where the Cour de Cassation, so the same court, will have soon to decide on whether, um, in fact, uh, the Belgian law enforcement provisions apply to Skype, Luxembourg company with no representation in Belgium whatsoever. Um, and uh, in a case of wiretapping, actually. Um, and uh, all the courts have, have, have said that yes, Belgian uh, legal provisions apply, uh, regardless of possible e-privacy provisions in Luxembourg and so on. So we have this funny history of uh, how to find the balance between, um, between, international, be between fundamental rights. So I just wanted to, to start with that. Um, but but, but more, more generally in the, in the area that has been introduced by Lana and that we're speaking about, uh, what we see in, um, in a globalized wor world of internet and, 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 and cross-border data flows, we see that um, more and more often tensions arise between fundamental norms. In, in the case of Google, it was between it is between the right to be forgotten, right to privacy, versus the right to free speech. We have uh, a recent case in Austria. Um, it's a Facebook case, so I'm, I'm not super familiar with it, but basically it's about uh, um, an Austrian politi politician who had been uh, characterized as lousy politicians, I mean, not, not, not super serious, and the uh, highest Austrian court has um, referred this to the, in the lower courts, uh, Facebook was ordered to, 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 to delete the information and now the highest Austrian court has deferred this to the Court of Justice. So there we see uh, a sort of conflict of, of interest between the interest to pro protect against illegal content, I would call it, and uh, the right to free speech, and right to information also. And the area that Microsoft is often involved is it's it's, it's a similar, I mean, it goes beyond free speech, but it's also the area of tension between law enforcement purposes on the one hand and right to data protection on the other hand. So, so we see all these, uh, uh, yeah, in, in different areas, we see that uh, um, pro providers as uh, tech companies have, have, have to make a balance between these rights. Mm? Uh, of course, because tech companies and especially global tech companies are often the ones, the first ones, to receive a question, it could be a question to delete content, to filter content, block content, or to hand over data. So we have to make this uh, sometimes not always easy judgment and balancing. Um, and, and, and what you see often in literature is um, criticism about is it normal that private companies take this role? Uh, is it, is it, is it, it, are we not shifting the, the balance from, from, from what sh stage should do towards what, what, what companies are doing? And uh, the point I'd like to make here is, I'm not saying, I, it's, I mean, it's good that these questions are being raised, but what I, I, I'd like to say, I've, I've been working locally uh, in, for, for telco companies for a long time, and my point is, I believe that um, it's not new that private companies are involved in, in law enforcement or uh, acting as online intermediary. It's not new that they are somehow involved into what public authorities want, how they want to maintain law and order. Um, think of the Sabam Scarlet case, which you may know. It's a European judgment seven, eight years ago. It's a purely Belgian case um, um, about whether uh, uh, internet access provider should filter um, content to, to, to avoid copyright, co copyright infringements, and, and the court luckily said no, <laughs> there is no proactive obligation to filter. But, but just um, the point I'm trying to make is it's not new. Sometimes we have this, these questions about oh, all these roles that the big tech companies are, are playing and so on. Well, actually, it's actually not new. It's been there always. Uh, telecommunications companies, banks, and so on, they also have to, to make this assessment. But what I think is new is that in an international context, um, companies who are operating over the, over the borders will naturally have this kind of more uh, broader view on fundam fun fundamental norms, and they will have these clashing views already internally in the company. Whereas if you're operating very locally, 
uh, you will be more filtered and you will have the filters of your national jurisdiction. So what I'm trying to say is not that we're doing everything perfect and it's a hard uh, assessment that we have to make sometimes in these uh, cases. But, and, and I'm not saying that we are always the best place and that we should certainly not that we should be the only ones to, to deal about this, but I'm, I'm just wanting to put forward that there is also a good thing about international corporations uh, bringing up, be, being more involved and more, re, more reflecting on these questions than I think what was the case when these questions were asked more locally. So, and if, if, if we do it well, then in, in the long run it could be um, like, uh, a push towards a further internationalization of, of, of human rights. So great. Um, it's really nice to have an optimistic perspective <laughs> on some of these issues. Um, and I just wanted to add one um, additional um, just fact about the, uh, the Austria case, which is quite interesting. It's a defamation case, but it, but it goes a step beyond the right to be forgotten case. Both, I mean, both the, the nature of what's being asked to take down is very different, but also um, Austria's seeking to impose an ongoing um, proactive filtering obligation on Facebook. So unlike with the, with the right to be forgotten cases where individuals go and ask for specific articles or specific pieces of information to be delinked, <coughs> the Austrian court is both seeking to have this obligation to delete posts taken down on a global scale and also an obligation to monitor and proactively take down mimicking and copycat posts on a global scale as well, which raises another set of clashes in terms of differing views about the roles of intermediaries and the kinds of obligations that can be put on intermediaries in certain European countries versus the US, which has a very kind of hands-off approach, approach towards regulating intermediaries in that way. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Gavin. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks very much to uh, Neil and Jennifer for organizing the panel. Um, so we've heard so far about the practical ways in which US and European standards on privacy free speech clash, and how as a practical matter companies like Google seek to work around this. My brief is to try and summarize the nature of these fundamental differences from a broadly European perspective. Can I use this mic, this one? Before sketching the key differences, which are certainly profound, I wanted to actually start by indicating four areas in which we can say there is at least recognition of common principles, even though the, the way that they then play out in the different legal systems is so different as to obscure the prima facie commonality. So first then, US tort law in most states does recognize that at least in principle, there may be private facts that are not newsworthy and hence could at least in theory survive First Amendment scrutiny. That category may be vanishingly small, but the recent Hulk Hogan sex tapes case shows that it is not non-existent. Moreover, the Strasbourg court actually borrowed from US law the key test for establishing a prima facie infringement of Article 8, namely the reasonable expectation of privacy. So it follows, therefore, that both legal systems recognize first that in principle there may be a category of personal information to which a reasonable expectation of privacy may attach, and second, that there can be such information that is not properly of public concern or newsworthy. US constitutional doctrine has come close to, but not, I think, quite categorically concluded that the issue of newsworthiness or what is of public concern, what Europeans would tend to call the public interest value of a story, is entirely delegated by law to journalists themselves, although their deference to journalistic judgments on this point can come close to being absolute. So those are my first two commonly accepted principles. Third, both systems recognize a public figure doctrine in the sense that public figure status can militate strongly against the ability to claim legal privacy rights. And fourth, both regard the claimant or data subject's own past attitude towards publicity as relevant. This is a relatively recent development at Strasbourg, dating from the Axel Springer decision of the Grand Chamber, which was delivered alongside von Hanover number two, in which the court treated the claimant's previous desire to seek the limelight as diminishing the weight of their privacy claim. To me, there's a major question mark over how this principle that Strasbourg's now accepted of essentially waiver of privacy rights by prior conduct, how that can be reconciled 
with the newly formulated right to be forgotten in Article 17 GDPR, but for now it's there. I think that will be an issue for the future for resolution. And those two decisions together represent quite a sharp rowing back on the first von Hanover decision, in which Princess Caroline of Monaco was, bizarrely to US eyes, treated as the equivalent of a private citizen. And the suggestion was made by the court that the class of public figures is limited to politicians and those exercising public functions. So as such, those two grand chamber decisions have somewhat narrowed a little bit the US-European Gulf. So those are, the, those are the, in principle, areas of commonality. Now to the differences, and I've identified three, and I think it's more illuminating focus rather on content but on, on legal method, if you like, basic legal methodology. So first, and perhaps most importantly, what everyone knows, legal hierarchy. Everyone knows that under US constitutional law, where the data controller is not a state actor, there is only one constitutional right in play, free speech, so that information privacy figures only as an ordinary legal interest, and hence, categorically of inferior status. For Europeans, the scales start equal. There are two constitutional rights, privacy and free speech, of prima facie equal weight in play. Second key difference is what you could call categorical versus contextual balancing. So because of the First Amendment insistence that even in principle justifiable restrictions on speech can become unjustifiable unless they are drawn as bright line rules, <coughs> doctrines that both systems recognize, such as public figure doctrine, operate completely differently as a matter of legal method. So under European law, the fact that someone is a public figure, even in one case the president of France, only ever operates as a within a dimension of weight. It adds weight to the free speech claim and it diminishes the weight of the privacy claim, but is never allowed to function as a bright line exclusionary rule, the way it does, for example, under New York Times and Sullivan in defamation and analogously in US tort privacy law. And the same goes for the way locational analysis, which both systems treat as relevant, plays out. For example, photographs taken of a celebrity in a public place, which nowadays, of course, might be done by any of us with our smartphones. In US law, public, public location generally, again, operates as a bright line exclusionary factor, which rules out even a prima facie claim. On the European side, we know, especially from the von Hanover line of cases, that location may operate only as one factor amongst many, and not indeed as a particularly important one. So in von Hanover number one, a key reason why the Strasbourg court found that the German constitutional court had given insufficient respect to Princess Caroline's right to privacy was because German law classified her as a first-class figure of contemporary importance and hence only entitled to privacy in public places if she had objectively sought seclusion by, for example, sitting in a quiet corner of a restaurant. In other words, it was the very development by the German constitutional law of a rules-based system for considering public figures and location that Strasbourg objected to. It required instead a fact-sensitive, highly contextual balancing act. And finally, the issue of deference to editorial judgment or newsworthiness or public interest. European courts are on the whole comfortable with substituting their view of, a public, of, of the public interest value of a story over those of journalists and editors, and hence inevitably making contestable value judgments about the relative value of different kinds of speech. US doctrine, outside very narrow exceptions like obscenity and true threats, is extremely reluctant to give courts, as organs of the state, the license to do this, and overwhelmingly preoccupied with the risk of chilling valuable speech by either insufficiently narrow or insufficiently clear rules. So those are my four points of commonality and three points of contrast. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, it's really helpful for, for contextualizing these issues, particularly, I think, the, the point about the, the relative role of speech rights and privacy rights in, in the two systems is, is quite important for us all to be thinking about as we have these discussions. Turn it over to Neil. Great, so th th thank you. Um, I'm gonna offer, uh, as we've had two two platforms and two academics. Um, I'm gonna offer some similar thoughts on the di at a high level on the difference between European and American views of the conflict between privacy or data protection and, and free expression. Um, some of what I say is gonna be quite similar to, to Gavin. However, don't worry, um, Gavin and I, uh, while we uh, agree on the nature of the problem, um, we disagree violently uh, or maybe vehemently um, on, the, uh, on, on the right way to resolve the, the the conflict, so, so there won't be a lot of fireworks yet, but, but ho hopefully some will, will ensue. Um, so th what I'm gonna say is gonna be necessarily theoretical, but, but I, I think that's, it's important to, to tackle these 
questions, and that's why we structured the panel this way, at the level of theory as well at the level of practice. And I think for, for two reasons. One, th the differences between, and I say this as a, as a European who's lived most of his life in the United States, um, the differences between European and American models of the speech privacy conflict are so entrenched, so deeply entrenched, that it's so easy for us to talk past one another on this issue and to dismiss the other side as foolish or unsophisticated. Oh, those Europeans, they're just so obsessed with privacy of fundamental rights. Um, they just don't understand the importance of free speech to preserving democratic self-government. And oh, those Americans, um, they have their, their heads up their respective uh, unmentionable orifices so much about the First Amendment because they, they obsess so much about free expression they miss the fact that human dignity, the very, the, one of the very foundations for which we have democratic self-government, is deeply imperiled by this kind of unchecked, harmful use of words. Um, so the difficulty, though, as, as uh, Laureline and Lana pointed out so, so helpfully, is that these deep theoretical differences have to be resolved by human beings, often human beings working at companies, at a very practical, granular level. Um, so we have this practical problem that, that we can have a theoretical disagreement, uh, but these decisions need to get made, uh, or uh, the, the GDPR police will come hunting uh, our, our colleagues uh, on, on the right side of the panel. So we, we also, though, we have this theoretical problem. We have these entrenched differences that are the result of deep theoretical differences, um, as Gavin got into, about the nature and value importance of rights of privacy and free expression, as well as disagreements about how to resolve conflicts between them. And it's this theoretical problem that I want to focus on um, for, for three reasons. First, I, I'm an academic theorist, and it's better for me to talk about that than, uh, I, I know a lot more about that than about practical uh, decision making at Google on the right to be forgotten. Second, uh, Lana and Lauren have just sort of done a great job explaining the practical problem. And third, because the Atlantic divide on privacy and speech is such a deep theoretical problem, if we don't come to terms at the level of theory with this problem, um, any practical resolution, and practical resolutions are of course going to happen because they have to, but any practical resolution is going to be a partial fix at best, one that uh, out of necessity uh, has to try and paper over deep, perhaps irresolvable differences. If we want to resolve this conflict in a successful, sustainable way, we have to confront the nature and scope of the deep difference between our two constitutional systems. And so having framed the issue in the three minutes that I have left, I, I want to uh, try and start to do that. So, so the, the best thing to do, I think, uh, w we are not going to solve this problem today, but I think we can do a better job trying to diagnose the problem. Um, both the theoretical problem and how that is playing out in its practical effects. Um, so Kirsty and I wrote a paper a couple of years ago called The Atlantic Divide on Privacy and Speech. If you're interested, it is available uh, on our SSRN pages uh, without a paywall. Um, and, and we realized, Kirsty and I, as do Gavin and I, actually really disagree normatively on the right way to resolve this question. We each think the other is crazy. Um, but out of a series of conversations, we at least were able to figure out why we think the other person is crazy. We understand the meta differences that are driving this theoretical divide. And, and we, we came up with, with t what we think are two uh, main factors that are foundational points of disagreement. Um, they are, to avoid giving s a, a sort of spoiler alert, um, first, the principle, and apologies for the, for the needlessly big word, the principle of epistemic doubt by judges, and second, the nature of the privacy right. So, so let me talk uh, about these quickly. First, the, the cultural power of the First Amendment in the United States, as, it, as it's emerged, as Gavin pointed out, out of defamation law, has meant that American judges have been particularly reluctant to trust themselves in ruling in ways that might infringe upon freedom of speech. They have the power of judicial review. They have the power to interpret the First Amendment exactly the same way as, as the European uh, articles in the Convention and the Charter, but they've chosen not to because they don't trust themselves to have the final say on what is true and what is false and what is fit for public consumption and what is not. And as an aside, I think it's also relevant to mention a lot of American judges are elected. Um, 
you may have been paying attention to the American political process, sometimes that doesn't always result in the most public-minded public servants getting elected, even when voters are paying attention. Um, so this reluctance by judges is, is especially pronounced when the press is before the court as a defendant. And, and this is what I mean by, by the principle of, of epistemic doubt, this, this, this idea of, of being really hesitant to say, no, you can't say that, or that thing that you said has to be, uh, has to be the subject of damages. Uh, by contrast, as, as Gavin pointed out, English judges actively, and European judges actively engage in balancing the two rights under the Human Rights Act of 1998 in Britain and the European Convention, and now under the European Charter uh, and the GDPR. Ironically enough, the English approach and the, and the European approach is much closer to the, uh, the method that Warren and Brandeis in the United States suggested as the correct model for privacy uh, 125 years ago, and I think that perhaps explains some of the similarities that, that Gavin pointed out. Finally, uh, the second point of disagreement has to do with the way privacy is conceived and valued, and Gavin gone to this as well, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but in other words, the, the US and the EU diverge on what privacy means and how that privacy interest is framed and how it is valued. So. In the United States, the tort interest in privacy is not really about dignity. It's usually conceived as, as, a, as a tort right protecting people from hurt feelings. That thing that you said made me sad. Um, or, or, or a stronger form, that thing that you said caused me psychological injury and I deserve compensation. Um, rather, of course, uh, English and European law um, have torts of, of privacy, whether it's the English tort of the misuse of personal information or, or a European analog, um, the structure and content is, of course, grounded uh, in the fundamental right protected by Article 8 of the European Convention. Um, and uh, the, the car, is, is, it, is it 8 for the, for the charter as well? Or 9? It's uh, 7 and 8. 7 and 8, because there's the, the data protection one as well as um, it's, it's 7, and then I guess 8 is, is data protection. Um, the nature of this framing, though, affects the way courts approach speech privacy cases. In the US, the cultural power of the First Amendment, the, the constitutional primacy of the First Amendment, makes it supreme over private law interests. And so when you hold an interest, even in avoiding psychological damage, against the foundational constitutional right, it's not surprising that the foundational constitutional right wins uh, under, under that framing. It, it's only weakened free speech interests like private non-press expression um, or, or, or maybe social media posts or, or compelling privacy injuries like the disclosure of sex videos as happened in the, in the Hulk Hogan case that is regularly capable of sustaining the, the, the legal and cultural power of, of the First Amendment. Whereas on the other hand, um, as Gavin pointed out, the, the European uh, co-equal status allows balancing whether it happens uh, through the proportionality analysis or even the margin of appreciation analysis if we're, if we're in the European uh, Court of Human Rights. So these two differences, as, as Kirsty and I see them, the epistemic doubt phenomenon by American judges and the difference between privacy as a tort and privacy as a fundamental right to dignity are driving a lot of the the, the differences and, and I think underlie a lot of the assumptions that the other side is just crazy. Um, and, and with that, I'll step back and, and look forward to talking more about this as our discussion unfolds. Great, thank you. So I'm going to um, start off by asking the panelists a question. Um, but as I said before, this is meant. This part of the discussion is meant to involve all of you. So I'm going to use my moderator's privilege first. But then, please, um, please, um, af once we'll, we'll take questions as soon as after we go through this. But this question actually goes cross cuts both practical and the theoretical issues, and it's about um, the, the geographic reach question. So the, the case, the, the right to be forgotten case, the Austrian defamation case, there's another case that's um, being played out between Google, Canada, and the United States, where Canada has ordered um, Google to delink websites that were carrying um, material that allegedly infringed on another company, Canadian company's trademark um, rights. Um, and ordered uh, Google to delink these sites or delist these sites everywhere around the world. And Google's been um, arguing that it should only be obliged to do so for within Canada us using geoblocking. And and the court said, well, no, the harm is taking place outside of Canada because most of the sales are taking place outside of Canada. And there's a 
there's been cases back and forth between the U.S. and Canadian courts. But um, I, I, I say that as background, that all of these cases involve efforts by courts to impose um, some sort of delinking or delisting obligation and to do so on a global scale. Um, and there are instances in which companies have, Google and Facebook in these cases, have resisted that. And so I'm wondering, the question is, w in what cases is it a are, are, is, are global takedown orders or global delisting orders appropriate? And when is it not appropriate? And this um, goes both to the theoretical question about how we manage differences across borders and also in practice. And, and just to preface the question one more time with one additional fact is that companies are making global delinking, global content decisions all the time via their terms of service, via um, copyright enforcement, um, via responses to takedown orders for, for terrorist content, for hate speech, for bullying, all kinds of ways in which there, there's decisions that have global effect and that's deemed to be fine. So how, at what point are, are global takedowns or global delistings unacceptable and we ought to start thinking about addressing these problems in a more geographically segmented way? I can I can try to address that. I think the cases where we observe uh, immediate global delistings are often the ones where there is clear consensus uh, around the world that information is unlawful. It's the same. It's unlawful everywhere, um, or there is a, a just a, a broader consensus. So when you're talking about um, uh, I don't know, uh, child sexual abuse imagery, about uh, credit card information that has been unlawfully obtained, uh, copyright, where there is uh, something of an international regime, and con uh, there, there is more consensus on in these areas than in um, the bulk of sort of right to be forgotten delistings where you've got a private individual um, requesting information about them that they judge to no longer be relevant. That isn't necessarily false, but simply that they say this is irrelevant or the conviction is spent or, or whatnot. And on, in this regard, we do have, yes, some courts that have ordered global delistings, like in the Canadian case, but also a lot of uh, courts that have explicitly rejected the application of the right to be forgotten. Uh, it's the case of the Supreme Court in Chile, in Japan, in South Korea, in various various cases. And so here we see a clear, a clear friction. And so as a matter of principle, it seems to us that it is important um, to uphold that principle that different countries, when it comes to something as delicate as balancing free expression with um, and access to information and privacy, uh, something less consensual than um, than you know uh, the the cases I the examples I gave. Then in those cases, it is important that we leave it up to each country to decide how they want to strike that balance. Yeah, I I I agree, I agree with that. Um, I I think also. Uh, so so I, I teach, uh, in addition to privacy law, I teach f uh, First Amendment law and, and first year constitutional law uh, at, at my law school. And when we're d uh, what we're discussing here is essentially a, a global constitutional arrangement uh, for the, the free expression and the management of, 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 of harmful expression or, or, or bad expression, if we want to characterize it, um, throughout the world. When, when we encounter constitutional issues, I, I, try, I try to tell my students, don't think about whether you like the plaintiff or the defendant. Think about the rule. Think about the rule that is being offered. And imagine whoever you think your political enemies are, who, whoever the, the, the bad people in our society who might obtain power, give them that power. And if you're still comfortable with them having the power, then, then I think it's okay. So, so I, I think, as, how does that apply to what we're talking about? When it comes to transatlantic issues, I, I think it's, it's easy for us to, um, to, to be a bit ethnocentric and, and, and say, well, yes, we might think that the, the French uh, data protection, I think, Keneal, is, is a little outrageous. Um, but at the end of the day, they're French. Um, and France is a functioning democracy. Um, and they are able to have a functioning democracy with broad 
rights of, of data protection and broad protections of human dignity and perhaps overly excessive intellectual property rights resting upon a moral rights theory. But but those those questions that we might those positions that we might think from an American perspective they're rather odd and possibly dangerous, they're not threatening to democratic self-government or to the protection of, of Western notions of, of, of human dignity. So we can have that argument. And if we think about a, a global delisting meaning just the G7 or, or, or meaning just uh, North America and, and continental Europe and Britain, um, that's a very different question from giving, we might be okay with giving Keneal that power within that within that world or or, or, or giving um, um, you know, the Italian data protection authority the American Supreme Court power but when we're discussing issues of free expression and, and I, I was particularly struck by, by Laureline's point that that politicians and celebrities are serial I'm not sorry by Lana's point that politicians and celebrities are serial abusers um, of the right to be forgotten mechanism or, or maybe serial that maybe that's a little loaded or power users of the functionality um, what happens when the rule of decision given global application is not the French rule, um, but the Chinese rule? Um, not, not the American rule, um, but that of North Korea uh, or, or Russia or, or Saudi Arabia, which recently pressured Netflix to delist, meaning to, to self-censor, um, a, a comedy special which, which made fun of uh, the Saudi royal family um, for their abuses of power. Um, that's, that's the problem, and, and so I think we should be really reluctant to, to accept, e even from within a European perspective, we should be really reluctant to, to suggest, to, to accept the idea that, that one rule for the world is, is fine, and to apply that broadly with respect to free expression, because I think while within the, the, the pleasant confines of, of, of wealthy Western democracies, um, we, can, we can afford to protect uh, data protection rights, privacy rights, as, as, a, as a fundamental right resting on human dignity, if we allow too much damage to happen, or, or too many inroads, or too many justifications for potential acts of, of, of censorship or, or, or reduction of free expression rights, I think we are setting ourselves up for, for an enormously serious problem um, that could threaten um, democracy and self-governance itself. As one of my colleagues likes to say on exactly this point, the, the slippery slope risk is that the internet ends up being only as free as the least free place. Right. I saw a hand. Um, I, I, I do, since we don't have, I'm, I am just gonna parrot for a moment the French argument because we don't, we don't really have that um, represented here. But I, I mean, the, the counter argument, of course, is that um, for European, for European, for the French Data Protection Agency, the right to be forgotten is a fundamental privacy right, the right to control one's information. And it's a right, it's a concept that's actually not unfamiliar in US law as well, um, and US Supreme Court cases. Um, and so from that perspective, it's a, it's a fundamental right that's not imposing that the US or India or China or Japan or, or China's not an issue, but India or Japan or Chile accept that right, but simply saying for our citizens that right, since we recognize that right for our citizens, their fundamental right to privacy has to be um, respected globally, not that Chile or India or, or the US have to adopt the same conception, just that our individuals' rights have to be respected on a global scale. So I'd answer that that sort of displaces the problem because if we give that right to French requesters, French people who use, residents who use the right to be forgotten, then how do we say to uh, citizens of other countries, no, we won't extend you the same courtesy? And that puts Google in the position of being the arbiter of what, what rules they are going to uh, accept and which they aren't in countries where they operate. And just to just to keep the um, the conversation going, um, and, and I, I largely agree with a lot with mo most of what Lana has said. Um, but the response to that, of course, is that c platforms are making these determinations all the time, and they're making really hard judgment calls about the scope of hate speech and the scope of terrorist content, and and even within the right to be forgotten, what f what's what's appropriately raised as a right to be forgotten case and what isn't. So so yes. Um, it, it creates, it puts the burden on companies to make really difficult decisions, but those difficult decisions are being made 
all the time in countless ways. Uh, another dimension, dimension that you could add to that is, yes, um, views on fundamental norms vary slightly or, or more <laughs> over locations, but I think they, they also vary over time. Like we see in Europe now, this um, extremely strong focus on terrorist content and, 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 um, uh, and, and privacy. <laughs> But it's 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 probably also something that will evolve, and 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 um, um, I think if the local laws don't get balanced enough, we will continue having this this kind of clashing conflicts, and 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 I mean it it would be good if if like EU law <laughs> at least could try to strike the right balance itself. From the start, so I agree with that, and I, I mean, and I also think that there's real as as Lana and Lorraine, I think you both said there's real prospects for. I think you, Lorraine, you you made this point at the very end that there's real prospects for harmonization and harmonization in a way that, if done right, can lead to an elevation of norms for all. That's more complicated when the norms are in conflict. And I also, just to be clear, I'm playing devil's advocate to a large extent because I largely think that geographic filtering or geoblocking is the right answer when there is a direct clash of norms. Um, but I'll just raise one other small issue, which is that I think sometimes there's a risk of geoblocking leading to over filtering or over blocking in a local jurisdiction because if a company can get a can respond to local pressure by um, take, taking down information or delinking content locally without having to impose that globally, it's easier to do. And if, in fact, a company were required to do so on a global basis, it might provide some space or some, some impetus for resistance. Um, so I think this, I, I just raise those issues because I think this is such an interesting topic and so complicated and there's so many different factors at stake. But now I want to hear your questions. which is not a standard at this conference, which uh, sometimes forgets about the freedom of expression and concentrates too much on privacy and data protection. Um, one question um, to, um, to all uh, panelists, actually. Um, do you have, don't you have forgotten um, a third uh, fundamental right, um, which is the freedom of information? Um, or is that maybe in the US incorporated in the freedom of expression? That would be a question that I don't know. I'm, co I'm coming from, uh, from Germany. And uh, we in Germany, we differentiate between freedom of expression on the one hand and freedom of information on the other hand. Um, but if you actually accept that freedom of information is involved also, I would say freedom of information is, is uh, affected uh, even more than freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is only affected indirectly, but freedom of information is affected directly. And if you accept that, I, I would say it's even much more complicated. It's not a bilateral relationship you have between the one who wants to delist information and Google or any other search engine uh, operator. It's a multi-dimensional problem because you do not have only those two parties. You have the third party, which is the publisher or the uh, webmaster, whose information is not foundable anymore, cannot be found anymore. You have the anonymous internet, internet user who cannot find uh, the information. So that's already four parties involved. And you have the public interest that information can be found. Uh, so you have at least five uh, parties uh, involved, um, all of them uh, able to, to found their position on a human right or on public interest. And my question would be, if, if you see that as I see uh, for, for long, how can you bring in the interest of the third party? It's not her the third party is not heard. The third party, the webmaster, and the internet user do not have a right 
uh, to a legal right to bring up their interests in the courts. Of course, if you would give uh, someone a right to be found on Google, uh, it would even uh, make the whole process, process much more complicated, um, <laughs> maybe unmanageable. Um, but right now, I have uh, the feeling that um, it's the, the whole thing is rather unbalanced, and the third party is the one who is the loser. And um, a second question uh, to Lana, uh, but also to the other panelists, how can we solve this black box problem? That is a private company that is deciding what can be found and what cannot be found. And we do not know, we do abstractly know, yes, uh, in your papers uh, that you do that obviously in a reasonable way, but we don't know. We don't know the cases, we don't know the facts, we don't know the, um, the, um, the Maßstäbe. I, don't, I miss the English word, um, but you know what I mean. Thank you. Thanks. I can, I can give a quick response to both of them. Um, about freedom of information, I fully agree with you. And yes, we do try to take it into consideration when we decide, uh, when our removals team decides whether a specific case needs to be, a specific URL needs to be taken out of the name search or not. We do take into consideration the public's interest in knowing that. The, you mentioned webmasters, which is interesting as well. Uh, we have a practice of notifying webmasters when we are taking down uh, a URL from some searches. And we have taken some flack for it. Uh, some states aren't, don't like that at all. But, but we do notify webmasters in at least some of the cases. About a private company deciding what can be found or not, I agree that it's a big responsibility and it's not one I would say that Google wanted or, or invited. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it took a lot of work and a lot of hiring to implement the Google Spain ruling after it was adopted. Um, we do, in a pragmatic way, again, like the webmaster notifications, try to address this problem. Uh, first of all, by working in cooperation with data protection authorities in Europe, um, when uh, the data subjects decide to appeal our Google's decision. Uh, if the data subject says, well, Google refused uh, my request to delist and I'm going to appeal this to my authority, uh, we then enter into a cooperation procedure with that authority. In the very large majority, more than 90% of cases, we end up, we agree with the DPA on the, dis on the outcome. Uh, in a small percentage of cases, we don't. And then these can go to administrative courts or in the case of those cases that are currently before for the CJU could go all the way up to the CJU. So uh, public authorities are still involved, at least in the corner cases where there are some real disagreements. Um, and then lastly, we have a transparency report that we publish and that we update regularly. It, obviously, we can't disclose all the facts, but we do try to provide a lot of figures and some anonymized examples and everything. So again, pragmatic solutions to try and address these problems, but I agree they're complex with many variables. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. That's a, that's a very important question that you've raised. In terms of um, freedom of information as a separate interest, as it were, I mean, certainly in the British approach would be to classify freedom of information specifically as lying only against public authorities. So you don't have freedom of information rights as against other private individuals. The interest that you have in knowing information about other private individuals will be categorized as an audience-based speech right as opposed to a speaker-based speech, right? So, I mean, to me, your question would raise that, that Google would, and I assume does, would draw quite a sharp distinction using the public figure doctrine, essentially, if it was information relating to someone who was part of the state, so a public official of some sort, and especially a politician. And in that way, freedom of information would, would, would flow in there. I'm not convinced that freedom of information is a separate interest when it comes to private individuals. Um, I would categorize that as audience-based speech rights, which, again, obviously, Google can and, and should consider. Um, Daphne Keller, by the way, makes exactly this argument in, in her case against the GDPR, a long article she's written essentially pointing out all the numerous interpreted problems with the GDPR, but one of her core arguments is, is that there are many more interests that, than the GDPR envisages in play, exactly as you put it. She identifies at least four or five bodies who, who have real interests in these cases, and she worries about the lack of those people having standing, in other words, to make their case to Google. 
Um, as you said, they don't have a platform, they're not actually involved. So that, that problem has, has indeed been identified. And the final one on, on black box and transparency is, I mean, you may be able to correct me on this, but we, I shared a little blog with you which, you, which was quite critical of Google, but it, it gave an example of four, four cases. And in each case, it said Google didn't really give a reason why it found this has a kind of pro forma, it just has a sort of formulation. Having balanced the relevant interests, we conclude that the content should not be delisted. Um, and that, that leaves the person unsure why Google made the decision it did. And I wonder whether, and I'm very, very interested in your views on this, obviously reason giving is, is burdensome, but it also leads to better decision making, which is why administrative law typically requires it of, of public bodies, because it forces them to think through their decisions and therefore hopefully make better decisions. And I wonder if Google has now become, in effect, a kind of intermediary regulator, that, that, it, that reason giving should lie against it as, as, a, as a requirement, given that it is, in effect, in effect performing a regulatory function. I think those are very good points. I mean, I think to date we've examined almost 3 million URLs and so part of the answer is sheer volume. <laughs> Again, like just the very practical how do we apply this? And then and so what kind of surfaces, the places where there is more uh, debate about the facts and the reasoning end up ends up being those those corner cases where there are disagreements. But it's true that at least at this point we're not able to provide an exact breakdown of the specifics of the balancing in, in every case, part, partly because of the volume. So I, I wish you'd ask those questions separately, because I think each of those is is, is meaty enough for, uh, for, for for long discussion. Let, let me offer just a couple of thoughts on on each. So on the um, on the black box problem, um, I, I think what we're what we are searching for is a recognizing that private companies are exercising this kind of power, or, or actually multiple kinds of of power. Um, we have a really good set of linguistic and conceptual and legal tools in the West for dealing with the problems of aggregations of government power, right? We have, we have constitutions and we have administrative law and we have fundamental rights and we have the, the notion of, of, of reason giving, right? Re reason giving not just to force them to think through, but to hold them publicly accountable for, which I think you, you, you agree with, um, to hold them publicly accountable for, for that which they have they have done. Um, private companies are not governments, yet at the same time they do exercise uh, increasingly large amounts of power, but in different ways and for different reasons than governments have exercised power in the past. And, and I think what we're struggling towards, and I, I think uh, you know, Google's decision under Google Spain to take the, the right to be forgotten implementation process in-house um, and to build this internal administrative framework is, is a step in that direction. Whether it's a step in the right direction, it's, it's, it's a natural experiment that we're going to find out. So we, I think we, we want to reserve judgment. Um, but th that's the, the larger social problem, societal problem we're dealing with is how do we deal with problems of private power? What are the best mechanisms for doing it? Are there things about corporations that that are make them different from governments, which means that certain kinds of regulation or oversight or incentives or legal rules or fundamental rights are, are inappropriate or, or need to be tweaked. That, that's, that's extraordinarily interesting, and I think that will be one of the, the great legacies of uh, the right to be forgotten implementation far beyond privacy law, um, the way uh, copyright implementation at, at some of the, actually a different subsidiary of, 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 of Alphabet, uh, uh, YouTube, um, it, it is a lesson for that. On, on the access to information, American, I think you asked about American law. American law would fold it under um, the, the, the First Amendment. The, the problem with, with a right to access information, well, there are several. One is that it is a, it's often phrased as an affirmative right, and American law is deeply uncomfortable um, granting affirmative rights um, uh, because of administrability issues. Uh, second, though, if there is a fundamental, as I understand, a, a fundamental right, at least in German law, for access to information, how closely does that butt up to the right against data protection? Um, is, there, is the universe divided such that you have uh, access to information and then there's, there's where Article uh, it's 8, we said? Uh, Article 8 kicks in and then, or 7 8 together, and then all of a sudden that's uh, protected. H how big is the gap? 
between access to information and and a right of privacy. If there's a very little gap, then I think that that has all sorts of of problematic issues that can that can flow from that even if they're just issues that come from error rates from getting decisions uh naturally wrong over multiple repetitions um so so i would say the the right of access to information it, it's it's good to talk about um but in terms of operationalizing it into a, a legal mechanism particularly a fundamental right i think is 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 quite dangerous e even if we can all agree that that some notion of access to information by the public is is important in a in a democratic society so just two two really quick observations um the the i i highly suggest reading the um, advocate general's report in the right to be forgotten case um he does talk about the the interests of listeners and, and focuses on the fact that in the Google Spain case, those interests were basically not acknowledged at all outside of the recognition that there's a different standard for public figures um, and really emphasizes that point in, in arguing in favor of Google's position in that case. I think it's, despite playing devil's advocate before, it's, I think it's ac like exact right approach. That's in the French the, the reference from the Conseil d'Etat. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the opinion the opinion was published a couple of weeks ago, and I, I do recommend reading it as well. It's uh, We don't have the decision yet. It's expected sometime in 2019, but yeah, the AG opinion is a is an interesting read. Right, and then and then just one other um, quick point on that. So it, this, this issue came up a little bit in the um, case that I mentioned before between Google and um, the Canadian courts and Google and the US courts. So the Canadian court said to Google, you have to Take, you have to delink these websites. Google then went to the US and got an injunction preventing enforcement in the US under um, our, um, what's the, known as the Communication Decency Act, Section 230, which protects um, intermediaries from liability. The court relied on that provision, which was kind of weird since Google wasn't actually being held liable at that point, and said a US court couldn't order this, so therefore we won't enforce a Canadian court's order to Google. Google then took that order back to the Canadian courts and said, look, there's a conflict of laws. You can't enforce our, your opinion against us. And the Canadian courts looked at it, and they, I think, rightly said, there actually is no conflict. We're not ordering you to do something that violates anything about US law, because what we're ordering you to do is something that you could do anyway. You have total freedom internally to make the decision to deal in con this conduct content and there's no kind of countervailing right on the other side for an individual to access this content so there is actually no conflict now in that case I don't think that would be a particularly good case for arguing that there's any sort of right of a listener um, but I think it again highlights um, why those interests also need to be taken into account in not necessarily that case but in other cases I saw a hand yeah we have five minutes, so um, I ask that um, we keep the, the questions um, concise so that we have a chance to, to all answer. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to be very concise. Uh, thank you very much for this discussion. It's very, very interesting. I was actually wondering, and my questions would be primarily directed to Lana and Lorelai. How does uh, the platforms move in the landscape of uh, fundamental rights? because we have the very complex landscape. We were talking here mostly about US and uh, European Union, but even we, within Europe and European Union, we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights, we have the Convention, we have the national laws, and uh, the Convention uh, sets just the minimal standard. We have also the Charter. We have national laws that can differ. So I was wondering how the balancing and how the analyzing, for example, the right to be forgotten, how deep, the, um, how deep it goes. How uh, does it, it's really case by case, considering also the huge volume of the request. Thank you. Um, on the right to be forgotten, it is really case by case, and there are teams of people who do only that full time. Uh, on, on managing to comply with different interpretations, it's true that even within Europe, you will find um, information that it is lawful to publish in one country that is explicitly unlawful to publish in another country, like somebody's tax returns, for example. In some places, it, it has to be made public. In some places, it is forbidden to, to publish it. So the principle we operate by is to comply with the law everywhere that we operate. And so we take uh, the local context as a frame of reference. 
Okay, I have to fall back a little bit on my background, uh, which is more in law enforcement and uh, also copyright infringement, that I did in the telecom. Uh, but, but. But the principles are the same, and the question, I mean, uh, the, the balance, you, you have to make the balancing, and there also it was a one by one, and it is still also at Microsoft a one by one assessment. But um, I think, yeah, you, you refer to this local context, and I think that um, there are two factors that play. First of all, when making uh, an assessment of, of a local law vis a vis the local human rights, let, let's say, <laughs> you will uh, ha have a tendency to assume that there, there is an alignment, so, 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 so maybe there will a little bit, a little bit less scrutiny there. Uh, and, and, uh, and the discussions are more taking place when the laws are being drafted. Like, for example, now uh, at the EU level, the e-evidence, the terrorist content online, and, and, and so on. Uh, and then also, the point I tried to make, I, I really think that there is, um, uh, for, for especially for um, uh, companies operating very locally, that there is this cultural thing. Um, if, 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 if you're a local company and you get, the, you get in a, a request from law enforcement and you know the judge and you know that Belgium is in the democracy and you will I don't, I don't say they do not ask questions of human rights. I don't say they do not make an assessment. But I think you will just have this feeling of trust a little bit more. So we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to um, give the panelists each an opportunity to say um, any final closing remarks or thoughts before we um, head off for a coffee break. I'm okay. I, I was I was very happy with the discussion. I want to say thank you to the other panelists. I really like the juxtaposition of you know I have the practical sort of perspective of of seeing how my colleagues apply this day to day. It's very interesting to have this put against a broader broader context and more theoretical perspective. So thank you for me. And thanks to the audience. <laughs> so I, I just have one thing to say. It actually builds directly on what on what Lana was saying. One of the things I I love about working in the field of, of privacy law um, are that the barriers between the academy and uh, the judiciary and, and companies and, and other uh, and, and practicing lawyers are, are so much lower um, than in other fields. And, and I think, um, well, I think there's, there's, there's two reasons for that. One of them is um, the questions are really hard um, and people are desperate to, to learn uh, from anybody they can, um, and so and it's important to so you ha you have you know theorists interested in practical structures and 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 practical practice att practical attorneys interested in theories, if only to, to figure out how to make sense of all of the volume of things that, that they're requesting. The other reason I, I think is that because of the 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 contingency and the fluidity and the ambiguity that happen in this area of law, largely occasioned by technological change, it tends to attract people. Um, who are intellectually curious um, and are comfortable or more comfortable with with not knowing the answer and with and with ambiguity and I think that makes for for for, for fruitful exchanges not only as, as we had on this panel but I think this 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 conference as a whole is is particularly good for that so so uh, I, I guess as, as chair I wanted to thank uh, our, our our moderator and, and our panelists and, and all of you for for, for coming, and, and Gavin apparently wants to upstage me by having the final word, which I will <laughs> give to him. Well, it was just something that occurred to me when you were making the point about how how corporations are not government, but they're increasingly acquiring power, and this is a kind of regulatory power that Google specifically has been handed, essentially, by a court. And it occurs to me that's another aspect of the division between European and, and US constitutional law, is that US constitutional law is broadly verticalist. So in other words, the rights lie only against state bodies, and you have your enormously complicated state action doctrine. Whereas European law tends to have a much more developed notion of, I'm going to try and say this word, and the German can correct me, Dvertwerken, or horizontal effect, or positive obligations, in which the rights, they're much more used to the idea that, that your constitutional rights are enforceable, or may be enforceable, against private bodies, which just doesn't happen, other than freedom of expression, I suppose, in the United States. So hence the, the kind of, the implied right to privacy can't be invoked if you are suing a newspaper. It's just ordinary tort privacy. You can't use the constitutional right to privacy because it's simply not applicable. 
I, I believe that that's important. But I believe also, though, be, being in continental Europe, there is a fundamental right protected by the European Charter to timely coffee breaks and to panels ending on time. I, I believe that's under access to information. It's the one that's next. But th thank you all for coming, and we will uh, see you later at the break. Thank you.